so it's time to get started. First, I'll introduce Bridge Terminal and then start the lecture. My name is Yohei Fukuma. While conducting R&D at Sony, I organize the event privately at the Secretary of Bridge Terminal. Bridge Terminal is a community space located in Sony City Osaki, Japan. With a large open space, employees can use it freely. For example, comfortable meeting, long brainstorming, secret meeting, daytime sweep. When the press event is held, special people may come together, make a workshop, craft workshop, yoga studio with high resolution sound, Aikido trial, Philharmonic mini concert, public viewing, welcome and fair party with table tennis and billiards. About six months after the opening, we started holding the events. Initially, we only invited speakers every other month, but some people started self-promotion themselves and others, and many people contributed to this stage. Since I can hear various stories, I'm getting more and more enjoying the events. Due to the corona influence, uh, we are not currently holding a face-to-face -face event. But people who want to have an online event uh, gradually increased. Therefore, we are currently supporting a virtual event. When the junior high school teacher came, they had a very nice presentation. When the uh, gymnastics creator came, she made a everyone healthy. When the street makeup artist came, she made everyone smile. When the kimono teacher came, she got knowledge everyday kimono. When Japanese sake evangelist came, they served over 70 bottles of sake and delicious local snack. When sound therapist came, she had nice meditation uh, time before work. When many families gathered with tools, we made mini affordability course and brought it home. And on another day, we brought many co courses together from children to adult craft seriously and rest together. We are planning more events in the future, so if you are interested, please uh, like or follow us on the Facebook portal. Today we invited uh, Ms. Rachel Cup to our event. Ms. Cup is introduced by our colleague Yukiko Jackson-san in USA. Ms. Cup is very famous person in Japan because she wrote more than 40 Japanese books. I'm very looking forward to hearing her lecture. Ms. Cup, please take over the stage and give us your speech. Over the stage and give us our speech. Okay, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to have the chance to join. It looks like you've had a wonderful lineup of speakers up until now, so I'm really glad to join that. Um, so hello, everyone. I am going to start sharing my slides here. So hold on here and we will get them going. Okay, so tonight's presentation or, or to, um, this morning, depending on where you are, is going to be in English. However, my slides are bilingual. I took a look at the list of participants and saw a lot of Japanese names. So when I had bilingual slides already, I thought, well, I'll just keep the Japanese on there, but I'm only going to speak English. So let me tell a little bit about myself. So I'm originally from the United States. I'm a management consultant, and my specialty is in working with global organizations, helping them be more effective working with their diverse employees. I speak fluent Japanese. I had studied Japanese in college, lived and worked in Japan, working at a Japanese company, which is where I got very interested in how 
people from other cultures can work together effectively very closely with Japanese colleagues and in Japanese organizations and how Japanese organizations can work with diverse employee bases. Um, I've been a consultant for the past um, 26 years. Um, and one thing I don't have it written on the slide, but it's very important is that uh, my firm has a very long relationship with Sony. We have done a lot of work with Sony in, in the North America, in um, Latin America, in Asia, in, in Europe as well. Um, personally, I have been to, I was trying to think about it a couple minutes ago, a bunch of Sony facilities. I've done trainings in New York, New Jersey, Miami, um, near Pittsburgh, um, San Diego, um, Silicon Valley, Tijuana, and Mexicali. So I've been to Sony locations and done trainings in all of those places over the years. So I have, you know, kind of a fondness for Sony from long experience. Um, so my firm does cross-cultural communication training, and that's our kind of our original thing that we've always done. Um, but in recent years, I've been particularly interested in leadership skills. Because the more that I work with global organizations, the more I realize that the way that leaders lead is really key to everything. And it's key to making a diverse organization be effective. Also, my US base is Silicon Valley. I'm very interested in how firms can utilize Silicon Valley cutting edge techniques, including um, agile software development. And for that world as well, the way that you manage is very, very important. And so I've been kind of interested in the kind of the soft skills side of how you implement cutting edge Silicon Valley style techniques. So that's all kind of come together in my recent interest in this concept of servant leadership which is what I'm going to share with you today. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to kind of tell you what is servant leadership? What are the benefits? You know, why, why do we care about this idea? Um, what is it that servant leaders do? What do they not do? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the skills that servant leaderships um, do, that servant leaders do, like at delegating and listening, et cetera, to give you a little bit of a taste of, of the kind of things that I usually share with people. Okay, so the, the, the whole idea of servant leadership is that the leader is the key and that leaders need to have a different paradigm, something different than the traditional idea of what a boss is like you would see in the top part of this picture where the boss is kind of giving everyone orders from kind of above um, looking down on people perhaps you could say but really is actually a burden to everyone whereas the idea of servant leadership is more like the lower half of the picture where the leader is helping point the way, but working hard along with everyone, may not be doing exactly what they're all doing, but is part of the team helping to move the mission forward. Um, one of my seminar participants looked at this chart and said, you could make the bottom part even more accurate for servant leadership if the leader were standing to the side and offering all the workers a nice, cold beverage as they were working hard and giving them a pep talk in addition to pointing the way. Because one of the ideas of servant leadership is that the leader does something different than the team members. That it's just not someone who's, who's doing the same work and then a little bit of leadership, it's a completely different role or different activity. So I saw this recently and this was um, a kind of a clip from a couple months ago of um, Akio Toyota, who's the head of Toyota Motor. And in a uh, management meeting, those are all the, the managers that are wearing kind of their work uniforms. That's why they're kind of all in white there. Um, and he actually gave everyone a little talk about what's the difference between a leader and a boss. And that talk was actually based on kind of a famous set of phrases by Harry Selfridge, 
who was a kind of a pioneer in um, creating department stores. So there's the Selfridges department store in London, and recently there was a TV series about his life. But I feel like these phrases are a very good, you know, kind of servant leadership idea that how is the leader different than a boss, right? And so a boss, as Selfridge describes here, you know, tells people what to do, uses the power of their position, makes everyone afraid of them, kind of points fingers when things are problems, tells people how it's done, says go, you know, gives orders, right? Whereas leaders, they're coaching, they don't order people to do things, they get people to want to do things, they inspire enthusiasm, they make it fun, right? And they create the, the positive environment. And so um, that's, I think, a nice contrast. And so this idea of leader is really consistent with the servant leadership idea. So this is a little kind of a, a, a overall definition here. And when you're doing servant leadership, your leader is focusing on supporting the team rather than telling them what to do. So a lot of people are confused when they hear the word servant and the word leadership together. But the idea of this is that a leader is serving their team members and making the environment one where it's easier for them to do their thing and to get their job done well. So this, the servant leader supports team members helps remove obstacles, listens to them, gives them feedback, and does everything they can to make an environment where they can do their job well. What a servant leader doesn't do is that they don't micromanage. And they're not mean, and they don't make demanding statements, and they don't make people nervous. Um, they're also not what's called in Japan a playing manager where they just do the same thing as team members and oh, then they're manager too. So it's really, it's a separate role. Okay. So why am I so interested in this idea of servant leadership? And basically it's because observing companies today, we need to turn the traditional idea of leadership on its head. So many companies today are too hierarchical. They just tell people what to do. They're very sensitive to what does the VIP say and just do what that person says, whether it's the best thing or not. There's way too much abuse of power and harassment happening out there. And you know, a lot of organizations, they don't really care enough for their workers, right? So we really need to change our model of what a leadership is in order to make companies more human, but also to make them more effective. Um, and because the benefits of a servant leadership approach have been proven, and that's something that I find uh, very compelling about this idea. Also for implementing Scrum or Agile software programming, um, you really need to have a servant leadership type mindset. It's necessary for the self-managed teams that are part of that approach. And so um, it's been picked up as a concept recently in Silicon Valley for that reason. So let me share a little bit more about what impact servant leadership has. Now, servant leadership as a concept has actually been around for over 40 years. And as a result, there's been a lot of time where academics who like to study things can study it. And there have been you know, a lot of people who have written their PhD theses, et cetera, on servant leadership. And this is a list of what's been proven about it, that it, servant leadership has been shown to increase company performance, increase team performance, increase um, cust um, customer performance, it makes employees more satisfied and more engaged. It makes them feel proud of the team that they're on, that their team is more capable than the average team. It leads to increased creativity. 
and more helping behaviors between employees. Now, if you look at this list, this list is really something that all organizations want to do, right? You know, want to have better performance, have our customers um, be more happy, have our employees be happier, more creativity. You know, innovation is a big buzzword now. You know, this is all about creating an environment where people can be innovative and they can perform their best. Okay. So as you're hearing this, you're probably thinking, well, I'd like my managers to do that, right? And so, yeah, that would be great. Um, and so hopefully um, your leaders will, will get intrigued by this topic. But at the same time, I also want to encourage all of you to kind of start with yourselves and kind of along the lines of Gandhi, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. So even if your position is not as a manager, you can start using servant leadership techniques. And that's because servant leadership is really all about good communication skills and good soft skills. And so you can be starting to utilize those um, in your work, even if you don't have the title of being leader. Interestingly, also, servant leadership is very, very popular among scrum masters. And scrum master is a role in the agile software development process. And why do scrum masters like this word of servant leader? Because a scrum master doesn't have a title or power that they can order people around. And scrum masters are expected to be kind of a combination of facilitator, coach, coordinator, parent, um, orchestra conductor, all sorts of different things all together, um, kind of like a shepherd in some cases. And so it's it, basically a scrum master gets done whatever they need to do in order to help the team. And the actually activities that they do might change depending on the situation. And this is this kind of very difficult to describe role um, people have felt that servant leadership is the closest concept. So that's a great example of um, someone who uses servant leadership but doesn't have a position where they can order people around. It's, it's a great substitute for that. Um, I'll also say that servant leadership is important if you're on a self-managed team, especially important. Um, because if you're on a self-managed team, you need everyone on the team to be taking leadership on something, and you need to be supporting the Scrum Master if you're doing software development in Agile style. Um, but also, as I said before, servant leadership is really soft skills, and so it's very useful for all members of the team. And so I think the key thing to remember is, is just giving orders doesn't require that much skill, but if you're gonna be convincing people, that's where you need these soft skills. And these are skills that we can be developing at any point in our career. So as we talk about leadership, I always like to ask people to think a little bit about, well, what is leadership? So we've got servant leadership that I just mentioned, which is a kind of a flavor of leadership, but even what's leadership? So I just want to give you a little thought exercise to prime your thinking on that topic. And um, first, we're going to look at What's a good definition of leadership? You know, a lot of people think, oh, tall people are, have to, are leaders or they have to be people with charisma. And it's not that. Really, anyone can be a leader if they exercise the right behaviors. I've looked at lots of definitions of leadership, and I really particularly like this one. It's from a book from the 60s, um, so very old. But leadership appears to be the art of getting others to want to do something you are convinced should be done. So let's break that down. It's getting people to want to do something, not forcing them. It's an art, not a science. It's getting others to do it. It's not doing it all yourself. And it's something you're convinced is important. You're not doing a snow job or trying to fool people into doing something. It's something you truly believe in yourself. Okay. So my, my favorite leadership um, experts are these two guys in the US named Kuzis and Posner. And they asked literally tens of thousands of people this question. So I'm gonna ask you to think of it for a moment. 
Um, think of a time when you willingly follow the direction of someone, maybe in the workplace, your leader, a boss, or a senior manager, or maybe it was your coach or a team manager on a sports team, or maybe some other situation. And I want you to think of that person who you admired and that you really felt like you were inspired to be their follower and be part of their group and part of their team. And then I've got a couple of questions for you as you think of that person. So get that person in mind, okay? So what did this person do to get you and others to want to perform at your best? And what did you admire or respect about this person's actions? What did they do that um, you said, wow, that's great leadership? And then what are some words that you would use to describe how you felt when you were on this person's team? In other words, how did being part of this person's team make you feel about yourself? Let's take a minute. Think of a couple words, a couple adjectives. Now, when I'm doing training workshops, we have a lot of chance to share these and talk about them. But um, since we're um, online, I'm just going to ask you to just think about it in your head. But think about this leader that you really admired. What was it that they really did and how did they make you feel? I'm going to share an example for myself. When I was in college, I was on the crew team. I was a coxswain. I weighed a lot less than I do now, um, and because the coxswain is the one who um, is kind of like a jockey in a horse race, has to be very light and sits in the boat and is steering and giving directions. And um, it was new for me to be raising my voice and projecting my voice and telling people what to do. And I was very nervous about it. And my coach really helped me learn how to do that effectively. She was training herself for the Olympics. And so when we would show up to practice every afternoon, she would just be finishing her practice for the afternoon. And so we saw her working hard. And so when she told us to work hard, we knew she was doing it herself even more, right? So that was, you know, she was very credible as a role model in that sense. And she did actually win a gold medal in the Olympics that summer, which was very exciting. And so when I was on that team, I felt like, wow, if I try, I can do this thing that's really hard for me. And if we all work together, we can really win, right? She was very good also at um, pep talks before races. So good that people on other teams would come and listen because um, she was so inspiring. So making people feel like they want to try hard, uh, making them feel like they can make it work is, is really great. So, as I said, these two researchers, they asked this to just thousands of people, and they made a list of what the most frequent replies were. And on the adjectives, these were the most frequent things that came up. So, I'm wondering if those are similar to what you were just thinking of just now, as to how your admired leader made you feel. Um, one thing that was very interesting is that nobody used words like fearful or scared or intimidated or I felt stupid or I felt sad. You know, no one that is inspiring leader is making them feel terrible, right? People follow leaders and make them feel good about themselves. So that's very, very important. People who inspire positivity and make people feel positive are going to be much more effective leaders. So effective leaders make people feel motivated rather than just ordering them around and telling them what to do. So it's all about connecting with people on that kind of emotional level. Okay. So I'm going to share with you a list of the characteristics of servant leaders. And so this was created by the gentleman who started the concept of servant leadership. And so this is a nice roadmap. What is it the servant leader does? And one thing that they do is they actually listen to people rather than just talking all the time themselves. They pay attention to what's going on. And so that can be some management by walking around 
or in these times now when we have to do a lot of things remotely, it could be spending a lot of time connecting with people uh, virtually, uh, making sure you're watching what's going on and paying attention to what's happening. There's empathy, right? And so there's, um, you know, that, um, that's been a big buzzword, I think, recently is, is how that's so important to be really thinking about how do other people feel and caring about their feelings. And, and part of that as well is, is paying attention to diversity and the fact that everyone may not feel the same way or think the same way about everything and be comfortable with that. Um, good servant leaders have foresight is they think ahead to what's needed and what's going to be required. Um, they also have the ability to create a vision and to be very, very clear about here it is, this is what we're trying to achieve. And making that vision be really compelling and really alive for people. And of course, the great example of this would be Martin Luther King and the I Have a Dream speech, right? where here is a vision that I'm laying out that I want to get people excited about achieving, right? Um, servant leaders also spend a lot of time helping their team grow. And that is through giving feedback and delegation. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but anything to help people get better and to grow through their work, because that's creating the future leaders, right? Um, Servant leaders are also healing. And so that means they're able to deal with conflict effectively. And they're also able to create kind of win-win situations rather than having someone feel bad when a problem is solved, trying to find ways that everyone can feel comfortable about outcomes. Servant leaders are persuasive, again, because they aren't telling people what to do. They're persuading people. Um, they also build community and um, help the team feel like a team, right? Um, and lastly, they're very concerned about stewardship and making sure that what the team is doing is sustainable and that also what the team is doing it helps the world be sustainable as well. So today we have limited time, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about two of these skills. And the first one is listening. Okay. So servant leaders have lots of people that they need to listen to, um, or any leaders really, but, um, but it's, you know, it should be listening to customers, to employees, to suppliers, to people in different parts of your own firm, and also listening to what's going on in the marketplace. Okay. And so for a servant leader needs to listen to people and find out how people are feeling so they can clarify what is it that people want and what is it that people need, right? Um, servant leaders listen to what people have to say, um, both what they actually say and also what they don't say. So there's some reading between the lines that needs to happen. Um, listening for leaders also includes listening to yourself, listening to your own inner voice, listening to your conscious, con conscience about what's moral, what's ethical, and also being tuned into your intuition, your gut feel, right? There's a lot of science that says that our gut feel is there for a reason and often we have gut, feels, feel, gut feelings about things because our brain has processed this situation at a subconscious level faster than our conscious did. And we're picking up on signals that we don't know why rationally, but our brain has made some sense of it. So there's a lot of science behind listening to your intuition, right? Um, and uh, I know um, a lot of times when I read about successful leaders, they talk about taking time for themselves time to think, time to listen to their own voice. And that is so hard to do now, given how busy people tend to be. But that's something important to try and make time for some of that uninterrupted thinking time, right? Um, because you need to reflect on what you've heard. 
you're getting a lot of input from people by doing a lot of listening, but you also have to process it, right? And so you need to take the time to do that. That's part of listening too, is this actual thinking about what you've heard and thinking about what you want to do about it. Okay. So why is listening important to leadership? Is because if you listen to people, you're getting better information and that's gonna help you make better decisions. By listening to people, you also show that you respect them, that they're important for you. I'm mean, sorry, important to you, that, that um, what they say matters. And it's a, it's, it's a way of um, including them in the team, right? So um, you also, if you're listening as a leader, you're getting information from a whole bunch of different people who don't necessarily think exactly the same way you do. You can get more ideas, you can get better ideas. Things that you yourself might not have thought of. So if you're the one who's talking all the time, you're not gonna find out what it is that other people are thinking of. And if you're a good listener, you can draw out other ideas. It gives you more options to choose from and more information. Another thing that's really important is a lot of people have ideas or observations or opinions that they won't offer, but if you ask them, then they'll come out. So part of listening is giving people an opportunity or an invitation to share things that they might not otherwise. And so again, if you're a good listener, you can draw out a lot of things that someone who's just talking and not listening might not get. So this is a really great quote um, that I really love. Leaders who don't listen will eventually be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. Right. So again, it's the way you interact with people is going to determine what kind of people want to work with you. Right. And if you're a leader surrounded by people who have nothing to say, it's going to be hard to be a good leader. Right. So I think listening is, is kind of a really key thing right now that leaders need to focus on because it's so difficult right now. And we, as I said before, we tend to not have enough time to listen. And we tend to put listening to other people kind of low on the priority scale as something, oh, I'll do if I have time. And then we don't take time to do it, right? Um, also today, a lot of the work that we do, we're in communication mode where we are projecting our own ideas. We're writing emails. We're on chat or Slack or Yammer. We're on social media. We're telling people what we think all the time. And a lot of times when we're talking to people, we're thinking about what we're going to say next more than what we're li more than listening to what they have to say. Excuse me. <clears throat> so it's very easy to have listen and get lost there when we're always focusing on what are we going to say. So really listening is about paying attention to people, but it's also about putting aside your assumptions and your hypotheses and keeping an open mind. It's also about being willing to hear things that you might not like. Good leaders ask for feedback from other people and are willing to listen to negative feedback that comes in and deal with it and not be defensive, right? So being willing to hear things that maybe aren't gonna always be so pleasant is really important too, right? So I've listed here a few tips for being a good listener. And these are the kind of things that, well, I like to focus on when we're doing um, training seminars. And you know, the first thing about listening is you have to make time for it. Now, recently in a lot of companies, the idea of a one-on-one -on -one session has become very popular, and I really recommend those because that's a time that is specific for listening. 
And I would recommend if you're doing a one on one to have questions prepared in advance that you ask your team member to think about and come ready to talk to you. I typically like to use a kind of a simple like four questions like um, what is um, something that's been really going great in your work lately? What is something that you've had some trouble with in your work lately? What's something that you'd like to get my help on as your manager? And what's something that you're planning to work on yourself? Okay, so that keeps some nice balance between positive and negative, right? Because it's really easy just to focus on the negatives, right? So it's really good to make people focus on, well, yeah, here's what's going well, right? And keeps the balance between here's what I'm going to ask for help on and here's what I'm going to work on myself. And what I recommend is for each of those four that you have them think of just one. Because a lot of people, if you ask them, they'll create a list of like 25 things. And that's too much to even focus on. So you need to prioritize, right? But if someone comes to your one-on-one -on -one and they've prepared those kind of questions, you can have a really great in-depth conversation and can be really valuable. So I would recommend having a structure like that rather than having it just be a, so what do you want to talk about today kind of situation. Those, those tend to be not as effective, right? So I think having a framework is really good. Also, if there's something specific that's going on that you want them to think about or, or you want to talk to them about, you know, you can put that as one of the questions too. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly like what I just said. But have, again, having a structure and asking for preparation in advance is good. Another thing that is really important now when people are um, doing more work at home is to be scheduling times to check in with people. And that can be just one-on-one -on -one conversation, maybe not as formal as a one-on-one, -on -one, but just checking and seeing how you're doing and having some of that kind of more casual conversation that you would have in the office, but you're missing when you're away from the office. And so you have to kind of consciously try to recreate that online. And also just having more team meetings, but you know, again, not a meeting, but just more a online get together where people chat. You know, some teams have a happy hour at the end of the day, or they all eat lunch in front of their laptops and talk to each other. You know, whatever it is that's kind of fun for your group, you know, break for coffee in the afternoon, uh, where people can kind of do some of that interaction. And then when that's happening, again, be listening, you know, to how that's going, right? But you have to consciously create those opportunities because if you don't, they don't, they don't kind of create themselves, right? And so you have to be a little bit more intentional about it when you're doing it virtually. Um, another part of being a good listener is focusing. It's really paying attention to the person that you're listening to. Now, a lot of that is body language. It's good eye contact. It's maybe leaning forward towards them a little bit. It might be putting your chin on your hand and kind of leaning towards them. Um, active listening techniques are also helpful. So again, the kind of nodding and aha uh -huh type of recognition is helpful. Also, um, active listening uh, where you say, oh, you know, oh, yes, I, I understand. I see. I understand that. And that can also get into paraphrasing where you might say, oh, you know, it, it sounds like you're really upset about that. Or that sounds like it's a really complicated problem that's going to take more time to solve. And if you kind of summarize what someone said, then they'll confirm, yeah, and then they'll keep going, right? And you'll get more. So sometimes just kind of repeating back the essence of what someone said can be very helpful. Paraphrasing can also be helpful just to confirm, to make sure you've heard correctly. 
So if you say to people, oh, it sounds like you'd like me to blah, blah, blah. Did I understand you correctly? Or it sounds like you're having trouble with blah, blah, blah. Did I catch that completely? So you can kind of summarize and then ask a question as a way to confirm whether you've heard correctly. Another key tip for being a good listener, and I know that this sounds really basic, but let the other person talk. Don't interrupt them. And this is one, to be really honest, that personally I have a lot of trouble with because I'm often so eager to chime in with my own idea that, that I end up interrupting people. And it's really not good, right? So you have to be very, very careful about that. Also, try to resist the urge if someone is speaking slowly, don't try to finish their sentence before them. Okay? Or don't like, you know, complete their sentences for them. It's it's you may think you're trying to be helpful, but actually it's really annoying. Um, especially for someone who's not a native um, speaker of English, that they might be basing their sentences on a completely different, you know, kind of grammatical plan than you had involved. And you might not be able to guess very well exactly what it was they wanted to say. Right. Another key point about being a good listener is to realize that you don't always have to have all the answers. For um, those of us who've risen to, you know, a managerial position, it's often because we're really good at the job. And we're used to having people come to us and have us solve things. And so a lot of times we feel like we have to solve everything and we have to be the expert on everything. And that makes us talk a lot and sometimes too much. And so what I would recommend from the servant leadership perspective is to not always try and answer everything and try and encourage people to be thinking for themselves. And you can do that with good questions. Like, well, what do you recommend in this situation? Or what do you think we should do? Or what do you think we should look at next? Something that puts the question back on the person you're talking with and prompts them to do more thinking. Okay, that can be extremely helpful, um, particularly as a servant leader when, as we talked about before, you're helping develop people to help nudge them into thinking things through on their own. Right? Okay. So um, as we talked about, servant leaders help develop their people and they give them a lot of feedback. They give them an opportunity to, to participate in decision making, participate in problem solving like we just talked about, and to be thinking of things on their own. So it's you're trying to get them away from a dependent sort of mode, right? Um, you wanna make sure that your team members have really clear job descriptions, have clear and achievable goals, and then you give them performance feedback and evaluations in a timely manner so they know how well they're doing based on those goals. Um, so you wanna be a good mentor um, as part of being a good leader. It's helping people grow in their work and to learn. And that includes when things don't go well to not go down that path of blaming, but instead be taking the stance of what can we learn from this and how can we do better next time? Okay. So in terms of um, helping people develop, there's two really big areas and one is feedback and one is delegation. Now, feedback's like a two-hour seminar, so I'm not going to go into that here. I'm going to focus on delegation just to talk about it a little bit because that's something that I think a lot of managers have a lot of trouble with. Okay, so we're going to focus on, on delegation. And I've got kind of a list here of like why, why do supervisors fail to delegate? You know, there's so many different reasons. And sometimes people think, well, I'm the only one who can do it right. No one else can do it properly, right? Right. Sometimes that gets into a kind of control freak. Well, I have to be in control. I have to be in charge, right? 
sometimes people feel like, well, I'm going to look bad if I don't do everything myself. And I'm going to look like I'm shuffling it all off on my team members. Um, there might be lack of trust in the employee. Like, well, you know, can the employee really do this? Am I, am I sure that they can do it or not? Um, some people are kind of workaholics and think that they just have to take care of everything themselves and then just get into that mode. Sometimes it's kind of related to kind of, uh, oh, I'll, I, I'll just do it myself. I feel badly asking other people, you know, they're all really busy and, you know, and I should not put more work on them and I'll just take care of it myself, right? Um, sometimes it means, you know, people get into the mode of sacrificing their own time first, right? Um, also, for a lot of people, they think, well, you know, it takes too much time to delegate. It's going to be a waste of time. By the time I explain what has to be done, I could have done it myself. The problem is, is with delegating, it's really like that old saying of you don't want to give someone a fish. You want to teach them how to fish so they can catch their own fish in the future, right? So delegating is really teaching someone to fish, right? Now, when you're delegating, you want to make sure that you give people enough of a chunk of a project that they can learn something from it. If they're only doing superficial aspects or just peripheral things, really teeny tiny building blocks, they might not get a chance to understand the whole thing and they're not going to learn as much. So you really want to focus on delegating uh, good chunks of things. All right. And I think what you have to realize, too, is that when you delegate something, people may not always do it exactly the way that you would have. And what you need to get in the mode of thinking is, you know what, they're probably going to do it better than me. You and I know I've found as a manager so many times, I've delegated something, my team members come back with something that you know, I never would have imagined that that was a good idea. But wow, it's actually much better than, than what I might have done, right? So that's the whole point of having a team is getting their different ideas and also getting someone who's not as overloaded as you, giving them the chance to really sit and concentrate on it and come up with good ideas, right? So it's, but it's, it takes a while to get into that mode of trusting people, right? So you need to start though, because if you don't start, you're not going to get there. So it's, it's um, you know, thinking about everything you're doing and thinking, what of this could I delegate? And if you think of from the employee's point of view, they want to be learning. They want to be growing. They want to be experiencing new things. And if you don't delegate to them, they're not going to have a chance to do that. And they're always going to be stuck in a very kind of passive type role. Okay. Um, being able to delegate is also really important with self-managed teams. Now, as I mentioned, for people who are doing agile software development and Scrum, that's a really key part of the process. And so I'm guessing that at Sony, some of you are using those techniques. So I'll just mention a little bit here about self-managed teams that are so important, right? And really what a self-managed team is, is that the team feels comfortable making decisions on its own without having to go to the leader for every little thing, right? So the, you know, if you think about it, software development is a type of work where people who are doing the work are really the experts. And so they can make decisions on their own and they can manage their own allocation, reallocation, estimation, reestimation, delivery, rework, et cetera, as a group. And they don't need to wait for dimension. I mean, it's a direction from the leader, right? And so a self-managed team has really good team spirit. A lot of times these days we have these kind of hybrid teams and we might have um, people from a system integrator from an outside firm doing part of the work. We might have some contractors and making sure that all those people are together as a team is really important to have self-managed teams work well. And another things that teams um, do in order to be effective, um, in general, and particularly for being a self-managed team, is periodically reflecting on how well it's working together. And if where, it's, where the team sees room for improvement to actually do something about that, address that. Okay. So um, 
I know that a lot of you work with a lot of people from Japan and might have some of them on your teams. And so um, I've done a lot of work with um, Japanese organizations or organizations that have a lot of Japanese team members on transitioning to agile and um, self-managed teams. And I find that a common thing that comes up is that a lot of Japanese team members um, have a tendency to wait for direction. And that's because a lot of traditional Japanese managers tend to be very much in that top-down mode. And if you've only ever worked for a manager who always told you exactly what to do, that deciding yourself and acting on your own ideas is something you might not be accustomed to, right? So if you are working with Japanese and helping them get adjusted to a self-directed team or just more delegation in general, um, you should probably really sit down and talk with them about what's expected and what they've been accustomed to and how that they can make that transition, make it more of a, of a um, sort of a explicit process, right? I'm sorry, I went backwards there. Um, so really what you need to have is if you are going to delegate and if you're going to take a step further and have a self-directed team, you need the team members to each have a lot of confidence. That every team member needs to have confidence in their own ability, in their own specialist knowledge, in their own um, ability to contribute to the team, and in their own judgment, right? And so having the confidence to say, hey, I know what how it needs to be done, I don't have to do things exactly like other people. I don't have to always be, you know, doing things the way they were done before. That I have confidence in my judgment in the situation and in my professional expertise, right? On the other hand, you know, confidence means being able to say, hey, I don't know this and be able to admit when you don't know something. Um, and being able to help out, even if you're not an expert, being able to pitch in and say, well, I'm not an expert, but I could have something to contribute. Right? So it's really important, again, if you're working with people who have up until now worked with a boss or bosses that didn't delegate, this might be rather difficult for them. And you may need to work with them to develop that confidence of doing things on their own. So those are a few um, thoughts that I had about servant leadership. And we're, we'll have some questions and answers in the after party. And um, before we break for that, I'll just say a few kind of closing words. So this has been a little bit about servant leadership, sort of what it is and you know, what's the concept why is it helpful? Why is it, I think, a particularly good concept for right now? Because it kind of brings together a lot of these different leadership ideas in one kind of good package. And it's all about the leader being there for their team. And um, there's, a, there's a famous book out there that's, that's called Leaders Eat Last, which is um, based on, uh, on someone's experience in the armed forces, um, where you know, if you're going to the mess tent or something like that, the leader eats after everyone else, right? And so this idea of being selfless and not putting yourself first and taking care of the people that you're leading is, I think, a really important leadership concept. And, you know, again, having this word for it and having this be as an idea, I think just forms a really nice counterpoint to some of the negative type of leadership that um, unfortunately we, we see um, out there. And so it's kind of a, a, good, a good way to kind of in, in help people kind of create their own model. Because what I think every leader needs to do is create their own model for how is it they want to lead. What is important to them about leading and also, as part of that, what their vision is. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? How do you want people to be involved in it? How are you going to inspire them to help accomplish it? How are you going to show what's in it for them? 
and why they should be excited about it, right? So a lot of servant leadership is really about communication and having good communication skills. And as I said, it's not just if you're a manager, because no matter what role you're in, you need to persuade people. You want to be helping other people learn and grow. You want to be mentoring people. You want to be coaching people. So really, everyone should be doing these things. So servant leader doesn't have to be have someone who has a lot of team members. You could be an inter individual contributor too, but you could be have showing leadership on a project, for example. So I think it's a very versatile concept. Concept. So I hope that this has been helpful and it's been great talking with all of you. Um, it's a little bit strange that I can't see all your faces, but I'm just imagining you all out there. So um, I'm really, and I'm really glad that um, you know, Sony has expressed interest in this concept and, and people were really interested in hearing about it. Because um, as I said, I love sharing it and I just think it's such the right thing for organizations now and the way to lead in the future when you're trying to create innovation with team members who have great ideas and by respecting in them and elevating them, that's where you get all the great um, rewards from having a wonderful team. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and what's gonna happen is we're now going to switch over to the other team's invitation. So for those of us who would like, I mean, those of, I'm sorry, those of you who would like to ask questions or just socialize and chat, um, let's move to the other team's invitation. And for those of you who are going to leave now, I'm gonna say thank you for participating. And I hope that this has been interesting and just sparked some new thinking for you on leadership. Thanks so much.